Hey guys, Brandon Harvey here. And before we get started today, I wanted to tell you about a very important survey we're conducting here at Sounds Good. And we'd really like for you to participate. The survey is anonymous, it won't take much time, and it will help us learn more about you, no matter how long you've been a listener or how frequently you listen to the show. So please take a few minutes and go to gradient.is slash podcast survey and let us know what you think. Again, that's gradient.is slash P-O-D-C-A-S-T S-U-R-V-E-Y. All right, now here's the show. Hello, hello. Brandon Harvey here with this week's episode of Sounds Good, the podcast where every single Monday I sit down with an inspiring person and talk about happiness, overcoming struggles, and living a life of intentionality and wonder. Today, I'm so honored to introduce you to my dear friend, Phil Martin. Phil splits his time working in emergency medical services as a dispatcher and shooting photos for amazing companies like Verizon, Kia, Gatorade, Coca-Cola, and Amtrak. Phil is also on the autism spectrum and is a volunteer and advocate for Autism Speaks, the world's leading autism science and advocacy organization. Phil has a beautiful and powerful story and an especially great life. I seriously can't wait for you to get to know him and learn from him. I know he's taught me a whole lot, so let's just jump straight into this. I'm in the studio today with the incredible Phil Martin. Phil, welcome to the podcast. This is so awesome. (laughs) Man, it's so good to have you here today. I am excited to be here. It feels really weird to say this is the first time I've seen you since last year. And it's just, yeah. I'm so overwhelmed with emotions right now. And you drove in from D.C. to I hang out. In. This All is so night, good. Through the night. And the last time that we met, you and I were on a train trip across America. And, uh, and I remember when I met you, you were just a big teddy bear. And you still are, <laughs> you know. Uh, Phil hug is the best hug. Yes. And, uh, and I don't know. It was just really fun. And I loved getting to know you on that trip. I enjoyed like Like meeting you was like one of my goals as a photographer. So it was, it was a big honor for me to meet you. No way. I Really? Yep. I'm honored. So, Phil, mm-hmm. you have autism. Yes. And like let me tell you, I had no idea when you and I first met. And I don't know like – I don't know if I l- knew all that much about autism growing up, but when I met you, I was like, oh, this is like, I didn't, there was no connection for me between like, oh, this is Phil. And you, like, I, I don't know if that even makes sense, but I was just like, oh, like this is just my friend Phil. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so it's been great getting to know you and learning more about autism. Um, but, uh, but when we first met, I had no idea. And that's, that's the, that's what everyone gives me when I first meet anyone they're just like no there's no way you have autism there's no way and actually um uh, during the trip i don't know if you remember i was stopping off in cities and i was taking portraits of people with autism and beca- that was because of a comment that someone had made to me hmm. about me not having autism they said you're too normal to have autism and i was like are you serious like like no that's not how it works like autism looks like this glass of water right here like you don't like you can't look at it and tell that it like it's it's there's no sign there's no external oh he has autism oh he doesn't have autism so i did the portrait project so that way i could capture the images of people around the country with autism to say hey you know can you tell he has autism can you tell he has autism autism is so unique it's almost like having like a special a special star in your heart Mm. or a special sparkle in your heart that's I like that description of it. <laughs> You've got a sparkle in your heart. That's amazing. <laughs> you know how to make a black man blush. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you and I were on an Amtrak train mm-hmm. heading across the country. And something that was really cool about that experience was that you love trains. Yes. Super oh, passionate yes. about trains. Like a train just came by the studio yes. and you were like, Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> As I was driving here, I drove over the train tracks. And I was like, I have to come back here and take pictures on these train tracks. Like, these are where trains live at. <laughs> and tell me a little bit more about that passion for trains. Um, so when I was a child, so this was also like um, a lot of people with autism 
like a lot of a lot of mostly boys with autism love trains because they're in a straight line. They don't deviate from their path. They have, mm. a, they have a schedule. So that's that's what the fascination is with trains. So when I was a child, my mother and I lived about four metro stations from my grandmother. So we would hop on the metro bus. We would ride down to the um, to the station, and we would ride to my grandmother's house. So every time we would ride, I would always stand outside of the train operator's window. He would stick his head out, and I would ask questions because I wasn't. I was more concerned about like what was making this train move. What was making these six cars stay together like what mm. what was going on with that so and this is me as a child like i mean like a little irritating kid <laughs> so i started to pay attention i started to say well this train has an ac underneath the numbers the letters ac so what does that mean and i was like well let me ask and i was like oh it means uh, alternating current and i was like well this train is a dc what does that mean a direct current so what does this mean so this train takes electricity from the third rail and puts it back in and this train keeps it and stores it and releases it at a later date and i was like well that's interesting and then I started to go more and more and more. And so I got to the point by the time I was 14 that I could stand on a train platform and I could close my eyes. I can say, oh, that's a 1974 War 1000 series made in Tolta Vista, California. Or that's a 1991 Breda 4000 series from Pistoia, Italy. And it got to the point where I could listen to trains and tell you which rail car in the entire concept was having a malfunction. Like, it's... No way. It's bad, man. It that's is so unreal. bad. And so... Do you feel like it's a little bit of a superpower or is this something that like other, other people can do if they study really hard, but you just didn't have to study it? Yeah. If they study really hard, they'll, they'll get it. But for me, like this was all just like years, years. Cause right now I'm 26. I've literally studied trains since I was about six or seven years old. So for me to be 26, I can say that I've studied trains for 20 years. Like that's (laughs) so odd to say out loud. Um, but the good part about all that knowledge towards trains is, so um, this is kind of going to tie in, I guess, later on in the story. But so when I was around 16, I ended up um, doing a project on the general manager of DC's metro system. And I called him, interviewed him over the phone. I came in, I sat with him, interviewed him. I came back to present the project later on. And so I was 16 at this time. And I sat there and I said, like before I left and I gave him the project, I said, I want to work here. I said, I, I will clean train floors. I don't care what I'll do. Like I, and I sat there and I was like, you know, I said, I know about this many cars. I know what this car is. I can tell you where the interlockings are in the system. I can tell you where every red signal is. I can tell you where every switch that crosses trains over are. And I would like to think I blew him away because he offered me a job. Wow. And, and you were how old? 16? 16. Wow. And the youngest age worked there was 18. We're not going to talk about that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, he was just like, he, he hired me right then there. Like, he just hired me. And he's still to this day somebody I look up to very much. So he's then retired and moved back to California. But, um, like, I remember going to Human Resources with my mother because I was too young to go there by myself with my <laughs> mother. And they were like, we don't even have an application on file for you, but you have an ID. So I had to fill out the application. And I was working. And it was amazing. Like, it was... Man. It was amazing. Well, let's bring it back a little bit. Mm-hmm. What was life growing up for you outside of the world of trains? Um, you know, what were, you know, the first dozen years of your life like? It was very horrible. Um, so... You don't just develop autism. You're, you're born with it. And I was born in 1989, and so I grew up in the 90s. And autism wasn't something you talked about. Like, you knew about autism, but you really didn't know that much about autism. Mm-hmm. There weren't these organizations out here. Like Autism Speaks. Well, autism Speaks has been around for a while, but there weren't. You know, there's the social media, the social media age and, the, you know, the era of just putting everything out there. Like, everyone can just grab stuff off the Internet and off their phone to learn about things. So... It was really unclear what I had. So I grew up just outside of D.C. Um, in Maryland, and I hated school. And that was kind of the first hint that something was going on with me. So every morning, I would get up, and I would be sick some type of way. Either my stomach would hurt or my head would hurt. I would just be sick, and I would cry. All I was in Catholic school. I would cry all the way to D.C. to my Catholic school. I would get inside. My mother would have to drag me, like literally mm. drag me into the building and then I would stand in the hallway, and the teacher would have to come out and get me to go in because I was afraid of all the different faces, the different emotions mm-hmm. I would have to deal with. I didn't want to have to deal with all these different kids in this setting. I was, I, my, I was, my fear was to see their faces. It was almost, um, was it overwhelming? Yeah, it's, it's completely overwhelming. It's like to the point of you'll have a panic attack. Me as a child saying that, you know, like, I don't want to deal with these people because, you know, this person is too mean or this person frowns at me a lot. And like that 
eats me. Like, because it's like, well, why is this person frowning at me? Like, what did I do to them? I didn't do anything to them, but they're frowning at me. Clearly, I've done something to hurt this person. Now I feel bad, and now my whole day is ruined. So that's how my days were as a child. Um, so that ha- that lasted um, for the first few years, and then I moved into uh, public school in Maryland, and it was kids that lived in my neighborhood. So I knew these faces, so it was a lot easier um, but I would still, I would leave school early, like every day, every day I would leave school early. Um, and I grew up and this is something that I'm, I'm really open to talking about. Both of my parents were, were drug abusing parents. Um, but that didn't hinder them from being amazing parents mm. because I know people think like, Oh, you know, the, both his parents were on drugs. They're horrible parents. Oh my God, they're horrible parents. They had their flaws. You know, I'm an adult now and I can, I can say, you know, they had their flaws, but it didn't stop me from having thousands and thousands of train sets in my living room and toy buses. And it didn't stop my mother from taking me to just stand and watch Amtrak trains coming out of the Union Station. Mm. Um, but it also taught me a very valuable lesson because my dad was a very high ranking official with the post office. And my mother had a good job as well with the post office. And through drug use, I watched both of them lose their jobs. Wow. And that's crazy because I went from watching my dad have two vehicles assigned to him, like two government vehicles. How, who needs, what one person needs two <laughs> government vehicles? I watched him have two government vehicles assigned to him. He had an office the size of a large conference room that overlooked the runway at an airport in D.C. I watched him go from that to a mail clerk putting mail in slots inside the post office to go out because of demotions, because of his his own behavior. And I watched my mother lose her job. But for my mother, I kind of feel almost like it was a blessing that she lost her job because she lost her job and it was like weeks before the anthrax scare in D.C. Oh, wow. And it was in her section where she did government mail. She did mail that went to the White House and to the Capitol and to the Senate and so forth. So I almost was like, and her friends, like she knew the people who had passed away from the anthrax. So I almost was like, this, like, although this is bad because you lost your job, but like I could have lost you at that point. And through them losing their jobs, um, we became homeless, uh, or we lost our house first, um, and we kind of struggled around. My dad uh, left. He moved to Baltimore, and kind of communication died off of him a little bit. Um, my mom started driving a school bus, and I'm still in elementary school at this point. She started driving a school bus, which means she had to be out at the same time I would have to be out. She would have to be mm. out before me to get the school bus out to the kids. So it left me to get myself ready for elementary school. And that wasn't happening because I hated school. <laughs> so I would miss a lot of school. She would have to come home on her break and drag me out the house. And I lived literally across the street from the school. Like from my balcony, I could see the school. I used to have to go inside on days I missed school and hide from my teachers as they were leaving the parking lot because they wouldn't see me. Um, but it, it, it made it very difficult for her to to... I don't know. I, I put a lot of stress on her with that, but I was—I didn't have control over that. That's something I had no control over, and she understood that. But um, that was my my first decade of life was was dealing with the stress of school and learning the fact that my parents used drugs because I was straightforward. Like, mm-hmm. like if I thought something was going on, I would walk in and be like, "What are you doing?" Like, clearly, I know what you're doing. I'm not that stupid. Like, <laughs> but. So I learned, I knew what was going on early. So like I was a child knowing that my mother did cocaine and my father did heroin. Like I, I knew this as a child and it made it easy. There was no denial. Like, yeah. There, like you couldn't hurt me with this information or like it was no surprise. So mentally like accepting that that was a positive that I was so forward with it. And my parents were just like, well, you know, and they explained that it's an addiction that they were trying to fix it and they went to different programs and different things but uh, nothing really worked at that point in life and as you transitioned into like your middle school years did you continue not wanting to go to school I did it got a little bit better Um, I was very goofy in middle school I was like well if I make people laugh then they're all smiling so mm. I don't have to worry about these frowning faces. So I did that for a while. Um, and then that's when we officially became homeless, like homeless shelter, homeless, um, mm. not just struggling um, in apartments in different people's houses. And were, your parents were still struggling with drugs at this yeah, time? Yeah, both were. Um, both separated still as well. Um, I have had very little contact with my dad. So we became homeless. We stayed in a couple homeless shelters. And it was just, it, be- it got to the point where it was like, it became 
just too much. Um, I made it through 7th and 8th grade perfectly. Um, I had a very um, great support system was the guidance counselor, Ms. Funderburg, uh, at my middle school. She actually took me and my mother in, let us live at her house for wow. about seven months. That's unreal. She had like a full basement with like rooms and stuff. What was it that you think she saw in you and your mom? You know, it's, I don't know. I really don't know because like today, like I don't think people would do that. Like no. even though this wasn't that long ago, but it's like, it's so crazy because I would come to her office every single day. I would be in this, like, this is how she knew me. I would come in her office and I would be like, I can't go to class. I need to sit in here. And so, like, she, like, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, when I get back home, I'm going to go to her house because I don't have her number. I just pop up at her house from time to time. And I'm like, hey, you remember me? And she, <laughs> she can't forget me. But I'm like, you remember me? Uh, You're like, I'm your old roomie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask her and I'm going to tweet you it. Yes, I'm gonna send please. Her tweet. Please. <laughs> And so she was your guidance counselor. Mm-hmm. Do you think that she had any clue that you had autism? At that point, no. I don't think. I think it was, I think she may have thought that here's this young man who needs some encouraging um, mm. because there was potential because I've always been the way I am now. Like I was a complete general, yes ma'am, yes sir to people at school and a lot of the teachers loved it. And she knew something was going on. She had to know something was going on because I wasn't just a kid that didn't, that wanted to give up on school. And there were a lot of kids in middle school where I grew up that were just like, I'm done with school. Like mm. as soon as I hit 16, I'm dropping out. And I was just like, I want to be here. I just, I can't be in that classroom right now. I need to sit off to the side. Like, can you go get my work out of the class? And I'll sit in here and do it and turn it in. So I think she, I think she just didn't want to see, not to make it race or anything, but where I grew up at, it's it's you don't have to look hard to see an African American man that has given up, and I think she just didn't want to see me in that same position. Mm. And so, fill in this gap for me between that moment and where you started to kind of be like, oh, I think I I think I have autism, and that explains all of these different things going on in my life. Mm-hmm. So my original graduation date from grade school completely it was 2007 just store that in the back of your head for a second so um i went over to um i graduated from middle school or promoted from middle school went to high school i went to what was then i don't know if it still is the best high school in the county it was like number one it was science and tech it was like we were, they're so smart so i was so excited to be going to this school and even like you had to apply and take a test to go mm. to this school and i applied and took a test and i failed <laughs> But I was moving to the area where that school service, so I had to go to that school. Oh. So I didn't tell my friends. I was like, yeah, I'm going to this school. And they were just like, what? And even like the administrators, they were so proud. They were like, look at you, Mr. They were calling by the school's name. And uh, I was just like, yeah. And it's like, you guys don't know. I'm just going to a homeless shelter near that school. Mm. But um, So ninth grade, I remember my English teacher, Mrs. Wilson. I can see her face clear as day. She used to embarrass me so much in school. She would call me stupid. I remember it. Like, oh. when I would try to read, I would be so nervous with reading and doing anything in front of all these people because I was, I was, I'm a great reader. Like, I'm, I'm really good at communicating. And I would focus more on the people in the room than the words on the page. Hmm. So I would lose my place really easily. I would be so nervous. I would start sweating. I would start stuttering. And so I remember something. She looked up to me and she said, are you stupid, boy? And I was like, okay, well, I'm done here. Like, <laughs> I, I'm never coming back to this class. So I would then skip her class every single day. And I would go. Her class was in the morning. So I would make it to homeroom. I would make it to my first period class. She was second period. I would leave school after my first period class. I would get on the metro bus and I would go ride metro trains all day to the end of the day. And then I would wow. come back home. So after a while... Of course, the school was like, oh, Mrs. Martin, do you know your son has been absent every single day since the first period <laughs> or some majority of his classes? And she was like, no. So she came in and I started to have to start making the appearances at these classes. And so Miss Wilson, again, I remember walking past her class one day and I spoke to her and she said, can I ask you a question? She said, are you retarded? And I was like, I'm sorry. She said, are you? you retard it because if you are, we need to get you some help. And I despise that word so much. And I'll explain why, but I absolutely despise that word. I, at that point, I didn't. At that point, I just thought of it as a harmless word and she was just being a jerk. But 
I was like, well, I'm done again. Like, yep, this lady just ran me off again. So I finished uh, ninth grade or first year of high school. Um, I don't know how many days it is in school, but let's say there are 250 days in a school year. I was present for about 27. The rest wow. were all absent. So second year was the same thing. Third year, same thing. So this is my third year in the ninth grade. So this is 2006. I'm supposed to graduate next year. Or 2005, 2006. So at this point, they brought in an individualized education plan. So the county school psychiatrists, they all come in and they sit down. And so they sit to me in this great school, this number one school in the county. And the school psychologist looks at me and my mother. She's like, you know what? He loves trains. He should just, you know, go ahead and drop out and, and go, uh, go drive some trains. I think that would be best for him. You know? oh. Yeah, she said it to me. Wow. And my mother was just, at that point, she was just like, okay. And then she flipped completely out on the school board. And they put me in different tests. Let me not jump ahead. They sent me to the University of Maryland and some other private companies to do tests on me to figure out what was there more. So in 2005, I was diagnosed with agoraphobia, school phobia, ADHD, and that was it. And then they was like, okay, well, you have these diagnoses. Now you need to go to, this is a school psychologist. It was like, we gave you this. Now you need to go to this next psychologist. So I went to them and they was like, well, we think maybe Asperger's is a more appropriate um, diagnosis and drop agoraphobia and school phobia. So mm. then they sent me to the University of Maryland and they're like, this is 100% autism. Like there's, this is, this she was like, you are a, like, just based off of the first 10 minutes of me sitting in, across her and talking to her about what my days are like, she says, you just defined autism. Wow. You defined a high-functioning person with Asperger's. And, and I, you were there in this meeting mm-hmm. at that time. I didn't know what Asperger's was. I was just like, oh, okay, cool. I, I All I thought about was this TV show called Third Watch. They used to come on NBC. <laughs> and I remember a kid that had Asperger's, and they called it Asperger's. A S S B U R G E R S, and he was like A S P E R G E R S, and I just remember like that's all I know about Asperger's, <laughs> and so I went back to the school and we said these are the results, and they were like, well, we're gonna put him in a secondary school. So by the time I started the secondary school, this was supposed to be my senior year of high school, and I was in the ninth grade. Mm-hmm. And you don't know how hard that was for me to walk into classrooms, and now I am this huge black kid walking into a classroom with a bunch of people that just got out of middle school. Oh, my God. So my first year of the school, um, this new school, this alternative school that was supposed to focus on kids with autism, a special education school, um, was very different. The kids had attitude problems. Kids were yelling. I'm just like, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. Like, It's like getting arrested. And like, I didn't do the crime. Like, I think you guys got the wrong guy. <laughs> and... They, again, me being, I was this big kid, right? Like, they had to come out and talk me into the school. I was not getting out of the car. I was like, nope, not getting out. Nope, not going to happen. So, um, and that school was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, wow. That school helped me adjust to the smaller settings at school. There's one um, person in particular, and her name is, uh, is Corn Chase, and she is a social worker. And she's now in Baltimore, but uh, she was my first school social worker that I feel like gave a damn. Hmm. And so like I I went through a lot with her, like from talking about my mother's drug addiction to talking about being homeless, to talking about my first crush on a girl. Miss Chase was there and she was sitting there with me and she helped me understand what autism was. And I, I'll never forget somewhere this paper still exists in my, in my possession. She took a, a piece of copy paper and she wrote a big stop sign in the middle and she scratched it out and she said, this is a form of your autism. There's no stop sign when it comes to your thought process and your actions. Mm. So a lot of times I'll make comments that are inappropriate and I don't realize it. I'll, I'll do things that I shouldn't do. I don't realize it. I've quit jobs before not thinking about what happens after uh. because with Asperger's, you, it's almost like you lose that ability to touch a stove and it's hot and you remember it's hot and then you touch it again. Like you, you don't think about the fact that it's hot. You'll, you'll, you'll eliminate it. So that really helped me because I was like, I need to take this opportunity. And she helped me learn more about what it was. So I became really popular in the school. Um, even though I was still, I still had absences. I still struggled with attendance because I still wasn't fully comfortable, but I was doing better. I was making, I was still progressing. 
Um, what do you think it was that was helping you progress and get better? It was it was the teachers. The teachers were so the teachers were so young. That was mm. the like they were you know, they, they weren't these old like all of these teachers. Like I could. I blended in with those teachers. I feel like we were all the same age because I was I was supposed to be a senior at that point. I feel like yeah. they were all still like in the process of getting their degrees. I feel like I feel like they, <laughs> they weren't real teachers. They were too young. But it was the teachers. They they cared. They showed they showed me they cared. They helped me along. They, it's huge. I feel like they weren't judging me. But I remember it, like the best story I can tell about. I and mean, people talk about like, can you describe your personality? And I was like, okay. I in school in high school I ran for SGA president. And I was absent about 75% of the year. And this is the new high school. And I won. Wow. <laughs> I didn't even show up to the debate. <laughs> I was absent on the day of the debate. It was a no call, no show. And I won the election. And I was like, does that explain it maybe? Um, I, I started to learn that like people... Like people want to smile and people want to be happy, and so I was. I made it a point to always like hug people and always tell a joke, even to the teachers. Like even mm. to the teachers, like I would tell jokes and I would make them smile. And at this point, I'm like 16, and I'm just like, am I flirting with my teacher? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, I would flirt with my teacher, but am I? Like, I hope they don't think it's take it that way. And then this is when it jumps into me doing the project and getting hired with Metro and while still being there. Um, but 2010, I was out of there. You graduated. I graduated 2010. Walked across the stage. I remember it. What did that feel like? It was. I was nervous to walk across that stage, but wow. at the same time, the last few months. So my first girlfriend was was in that school, uh, and her and I broke up shortly before graduation, and she brought her new boyfriend to graduation. So oh. I was pissed. So I'm sitting there like, God, I should just fight. Like I should just fight everybody. So I was so over it. Like I, was, I got my diploma, and they like dismissed us, and I was like, Peace. I ain't saying bye to nobody. Goodbye, everybody. And I ran into him as I was leaving, the new boyfriend. I'm just it's like the worst. Like I should hit you right now. Like, like you're not even cute. Like what? I was, what is she thinking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. So what happened next after high school? What did you? Because at this point you had already quit the metro job. Mm -hmm. Okay. I quit. I went on to be. So there was this youth council uh, that was under the DC mayor's office. And I went, I was, because I had all these years, because throughout the entire ordeal, I was homeless. That's just what I didn't talk about. It was, Wait, it's, so you were homeless all the way through all graduation. Way through, all the way through. I was homeless the entire time. We were in, in different shelters. Unreal. Um, but it, 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 it had become normal. So I, I skip over that when I'm talking to people. And they're like, well, when did you guys like get a house? I was like, oh, well, we moved in with my sister after school. I had no idea. Yeah, because it was, it becomes so normal of being in these shelters and, and staying with family that it was just like, well. This is this is normal. Um, so there was this youth council called the D.C. Youth Advisory Council. And it was 32 spots on this council. And I went in and I was like, I want to be on this council. And they was like, well, we're kind of full, but we have at-large positions. And I was like, well, there's like, you have to be in foster care or some other stuff. And I was like, well, I'm homeless. They was like, well, we have a spot for that. Hmm. So I spent the first year on the council as an at-large council member. And we basically were like junior advisors to the mayor. We would talk about youth issues. And the next year, I ran for vice chair, and I, I got it. Wow. And then the year after that, I ran for chairman, and I got it. And I chaired the council for about three years um, before I got upset and quit and resigned. And then I went on to get my emergency medical technician. And then I started working at an ambulance company, and I hated it. And I got a new job, and I started working as a dispatcher. And... Yeah, that's that was like my intro to public safety. Like that's where I jumped into public safety is when I resigned from the Youth Advisory Council. Do you have any idea what it was that drew you to just public service in general? Because it's a clear path, even though you kind of jumped in and out of a few things. Mm -hmm. But is there something about you that you feel like drew you to that? I don't know. It's like I want to help people. Like that's just that's like it's so weird. You hear people saying that, and it's such a corny answer. But they say, "Oh, I want to help," but like I really do. Mm -hmm. Like I. I nothing makes me happier than being in the fire station and we're sitting there and then the bell goes off and it's like we look up at the board and it's like oh someone's having chest pains let's go change this person's day around wow like that's what's happening like when we get in that ambulance and we cut the lights on we're going down the road it's like we're gonna go like we we, we joke all the way there and it's like we, we turn into this new mode when we get there and it's like it's it's unbelievable. 
and I've won, I've received three life-saving awards. Wow. Um, to date. For, uh, can you tell me the story of... I'll tell you one got, that, okay. that me and my friends joke about a lot. We were, we were out, we were on the fire truck, and um, we were out getting food, and they put out a, uh, a CPR call. And we were going to be the first one on scene. The, am- the the two ambulances that were coming were coming from a little bit farther. We were the first one on scene. So actually, it came out, I think it's trouble breathing. So as we're going down the road, they were they called us on the radio. And it was like, be advised, the supplements to the call advised that the person is now no longer breathing. And so I'm just like, oh, damn it. So I get out. I didn't grab anything. I ran in. And my one of my closest friends, he always like he tells a story, and it makes me sound like I was like a superhero. I ran in, I slid across the floor on my knees, <laughs> and began CPR. And so he came in with the bags, and he started doing the compressions. I mean the um, the air, and I'm doing CPR. And so when he does the air, I take my coat off, and I throw my coat around the room. I'm doing CPR, and then everyone comes in, and people all around, I'm like get back. <laughs> but um, he lived. Incredible! He lived. You saved his life. Yeah, but it's not always always good days. Um, I don't know if I can share sad stories. Am I allowed to share sad stories? You can share sad stories. Uh, last month or two, well, over the last two months, I've had two infant deaths mm. and one that was a save. And it's like it's I can't even begin to explain the feeling that goes through your body when. You when they, they they give you a lot of information over the radio as you're responding to the call, but the feeling that you get it's almost like you disregard everything. And the one that was the saddest was it was a it was a daycare that was not supposed to be operating, and the baby choked and passed away at the daycare. And the call came out as one not breathing, and so we're responding. We're already responding. We're on ten because it's one not breathing. As we're getting closer, my son is nine months old. As we're getting closer, then he was seven months old. As we're getting closer, they'll say, they said, communications to ambulance, so-and-so. They was like, be advised, it's going to be a seventh month old not breathing. So I'm like, all I see is my son. That's all I see. Mm. All I see is my son. So we get there. Like I, I drove so fast. We got there. At this time, another ambulance got on scene before us. Um, they were like, they need a driver. I got in. I drove to the hospital. I stood there, and I watched them work so hard for so long. Um, and they, they wasn't able to get the baby back. And then, but we got to save though. We also had to save. There was a little girl. She was outside playing, just playing. And she dropped and she was the same age as my nephew. She was nine years old and we were responding. And then they gave us a supplement over the radio. They was like, PFI is going to be a nine year old, not breathing. We got there. She's in the middle of the street. They're on CPR. Um, we load her up. They worked her for about 30 minutes at the hospital. She was, she was blue. They, they, I at this point I knew there was nothing they were gonna do. The no amount of steroids or or A D shocks was gonna get this girl back and it was so evident, but they would not give up. And then it was like they said they said we're gonna do two more rounds of two more rounds of Epi and they were gonna call it after that. And they did one round of Epi and they said, All right, let's stop and they were checking the monitors. And she had a pulse. And mm. I was just like, Are you, did that just happen? Like, I'm like already sweating and crying. Like, my face looked like so horrible. I looked like like the pictures of Whitney Houston where she sweat real sweaty. Like, I was just real <laughs> wet. I was just wet. And they brought her back. And it was like, like, we were a part of that. Like, and although we'll never, I don't want recognition for it. Like, we'll never get recognition for it probably. But the fact that we were a part of this family being able to watch this little girl grow up and for this little girl to have her own family one day. Like, even though I will probably never see her again, Hmm. I know that we were a part of that. What do experiences like that do to you on a day-to-day basis? The highs and the lows? That's stuff that I'll never experience. Yeah, the lows really break you down. The the lows make you, you have to be careful because like, with the child we lost, like I, I, I took that home to my family. Like I took it home and, to Bryce's mom and you know I was so upset with her I was just like well you need to do this They're like we need to do better background checks and like it'll stress you out to the point because she doesn't understand you know what I mean like I'll tell her oh someone passed away and she's like to her like she, only time she's seen someone pass away in front of her eyes is on a movie and it's not real like for me to look into the eyes of a child that is not alive is very like it's it's so stressful but the highs though it kind of motivates you like you, you go out and get something to eat afterwards. Like you go out and like it just changes everything. Like it reminds you of why you're doing what you're doing. Wow. 
really quick, I want to transition to this other thing that you do. You're also an incredibly talented photographer. Am I? And that's how, no, you're no. incredible. <laughs> that's how we first connected. And I love your work. I love following along Thank your work you. on Instagram. And I also love, uh, I just discovered today, I don't know how I didn't realize this, that you've got an Instagram account for your son, Bryce. <laughs> and Bryce, oh my gosh, you guys, I just met. Uh, I just met your son and he is the cutest and I love just scrolling through all of his photos. Yes. But but for the most part you work with brands and oh also though you've done a lot of work with Amtrak. You've yes. done some incredible work um and it's really fun to see you be able to take these two passions, trains and mm-hmm. photography and combine them together. It's I'm really excited and actually I just got the phone yesterday with Amtrak and we're going to be teaming up on a project um the very last day of this month. We're going to go out, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about it, but we're going to go out on the real road. We're going to shoot some stuff. Um, Incredible. For some upcoming campaigns. And I'm just like, even though, like, I'm I'm so excited about it. Even though most people are going to see these pictures, they're going to see this, this, this content, they're going to be like, oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, that looks like a fun time. I am secretly about it. Like, that's me. I, take that. I think about, and this is loser, hopefully uh, Zach Glassman will hear this and laugh at this part, but I think about the show 30 Rock. And, uh, love 30 Rock. and Liz Lemon is sitting at the TV after she finished a Deal Breakers episode and they didn't use her show and they put her, they, her TV shows plays on the TV shows, like in the background. <laughs> yeah. And so she's sitting there, she's like, that's me. <laughs> so like when I see my images, I'm like, I took that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's kind of like in Monsters Inc. when uh, Mike Wazowski, every single time that they're on like the cover of the magazine or on that commercial, like he gets covered up with like the UPC code or the yes, logo, yes. and he's like, "I am on the cover of a <laughs> yeah. magazine." He's so excited. That's all I care about. It's like, and actually, I shot the cover of Amtrak's uh, magazine. Oh, and it looks so good. I went into their because their headquarters is in DC. I went into the office. They told me what they were looking for. They said they wanted something to show uh, their employees interacting with custo- uh, passengers for the holidays. I went downstairs to the platform. I was walking to the train I was going to get on to ride up to Philly. And I saw this conductor standing there. And I was like, Chick. and that was one of these. Man, tell me about falling in love. Um, that is such a difficult thing with autism um, because there's so many different emotions. Like, to, to fall in love with someone with autism and, like, maintain it, you have to basically walk on eggshells at all times. It's very frustrating, and I feel bad for um, every girl I've ever dated <laughs> because it's very, like, emotions. You have to approach everything carefully. Mm. You, If you're having a bad day at work, you really have to leave it outside of, of me because... I'm going to read it as I did something and then I'm going to develop an attitude and then we're going to fight for days over a misunderstanding and you have to adapt. You have to understand that autism is ultimately a communication disorder. So I'm not going to know how to communicate what's wrong with me to you. I'm not going to know how to, to tell you what's wrong. I'm not going to know how to read what you're saying. I'm not going to always want to talk. I'm sometimes going to be silent on the phone or, or be really basic and dry with you. And it takes a lot. Like, you have to really love somebody to to be with somebody mm. with, with autism. You have to love them because if you don't really love them and you're not in it to be in it, then it's going to fail. I just met your incredible girlfriend, mm-hmm. and she's lovely. Yes. And it seems like she really, truly loves you, and I yes. know that you love her. I do. How I long do. have you guys been together? We've been together now since... Well, we met, what year is this? What year is this? 2016? So we met actually December of 2014. Wow. Um, I, she's a photographer. She doesn't want me to tell people that. because She's, she's great. She's uh, like, uh, she's like, oh, I'm not on that level yet. I'm like, yes, you are. Stop talking. <laughs> um, but uh, I found her work on Instagram and I sent her a message and I was like, I, it was one portrait in particular. I was like, I love this. And I ended up eventually saying, okay, so we should hang out. And we hung out and Things apparently went well because now we have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and Bryce is the cutest. He is. He's so mean though. He's so like he's he's he for the first few months of his life, he had I just he didn't smile, he was just like this all the time. And like it makes me think of uh, the last man in black that came out where Will Smith went back in time and he was like he's looking for a real surly man that smiles like this. Like a frowny <laughs> face. Bryce just didn't smile for a while. So when he started smiling and those dimples show, it was like, oh my God, he's even cuter than we thought. Um, yeah, he's amazing. Like nothing, nothing. I don't remember life before him. Like yeah. life didn't exist before him. 
what has it felt like being a dad? Like what? It's scary and it's amazing at the same time. It's amazing. I'll start with the amazing. It's amazing because I am going to be a part of this child's growing up. Like, be, I, don't, I don't know where I heard this from. It was a TV show movie, but like, my actions are going to determine whether or not this child is a awesome person or a jerk. Mm. Like, the the steps that we take now are going to determine what happens in the future, and that's amazing. And we're working really hard to make sure that he's going to grow up to be an awesome person. We're going to make sure that he grows up understanding what love is and understanding that he's going to love everybody. I don't care who they are. If they treat you like crap, love them. If they love you, love them even more. Like, he's going to love everybody. He's going to mm. hug everybody. We let him cry. We hug him nonstop. I kiss him nonstop. It's weird. People will look at me. And I'm just like, mwah, 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 mwah. I can't stop kissing that boy. That's I want incredible. him to feel so much love and it's what my mother did to me my mother instilled so much love into me even though she had everything that with her that was going on she put so much love into my heart that i have to put it into him That's so that beautiful. he can carry to keep it going what are you trying to teach him as a father to a son that your own father wasn't able to teach you um it's it's weird like i want to teach him how important family is um how important family is and how important it is to to be respectful but I, I so I was just talking about this the other day I have a weird I'm not knocking the type of people but I just look at people who are the people that have like the kids that are really strict in the house like they come like they're in the house and they're like yes ma'am yes sir they should be and they're like so scared to do anything I don't want Bryce to be like that I want him to be like that outside the house like you better yes sir yes ma'am everybody outside the house but come in and lay back and chill like be Mm. a kid in here be a kid like turn up in here (laughs) and then go outside and pretend like you live like the president's child like Mm. do that and so I I just just, that's what I want him to know I want him to know he can be relaxed with us I want him to know how important family is that it's everything like whether or not you need someone to talk to or you need help or you need to be held like it's right there you need to fight fight with your family members (laughs) like everything is is in your like it's uh, i can't even it's so hard to explain (laughs) that's beautiful um i love that one thing is that that breaks my heart with raising him right now is so i lost my mother a few years ago and it was so hard to watch because she uh passed away on home hospice so we basically we watched her entire decline like Mm. it's 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 hard period losing a parent but when you have to watch the decline, it is it's it makes you stronger. At the same time, it breaks you completely down to nothing, because here you have this person that raised you, this person that made you who you are. All the people that say, "Oh my God, Phil is this, Phil is that, Phil is such an amazing person," they're basically saying Rosetta is this amazing person because this is she built me to who I am, and so watch the person that built you struggle and just fall so hard to the point where they're they're gone is like it almost makes you question your existence like and i did i i thought about if i wanted to be here anymore after that so it really hurts me that he's not going to be able to meet her that's why i'm trying to push all the love she gave me into him so that way he i know that although he's not physically meeting her he is getting the love from her that she put in me it's beautiful. Thank you. That's really, really beautiful. <laughs> it took a lot. That's the first time I've talked about my mother in detail without crying. That is the first time. Usually I break down. Like on the on the trip, after Ruthie spoke about her dad and everything that she went through, um, a lot of people don't know this, but I pulled her into my our, our little roomette, and I said, I got to cry. And she sat there and held me while I cried. Mm. And that's one of those things about the trip. Like, that trip was a group of strangers. Like, I didn't know who Ruthie Lindsay was before that trip. I had no idea who she was. But this lady is sitting here with her arms around me while I cry into her shoulder because I had lost my mom not too long before the trip. And so I'm sitting here crying into her, her shoulder, and I didn't know who she was a week and a half ago. So, like, that trip was was... I'm sitting across my table from you after I just drove through the night and got pulled over so I can sit here with you face to face because I didn't want it to be impersonal over the phone. Not saying that people that do it over the phone are impersonal, right? <laughs> but I want it to be like, I wanted it to be real. Like I wanted to mm. see your face because I miss you guys so much. I think there's something really powerful about shared experiences. 
you know, I think the fact that you and I boarded an Amtrak train and we got to take it from point A to point B and had so many experiences in the middle, it does something. And and it do, you don't have to hop on an Amtrak train, although I'm sure Phil, you yes. love for people to get an Amtrak train. But uh, but you know, just having experiences with people, you know, ro- like my friends who I've gone on road trips with are they're so much better friends than people who have you know, sat in Nashville and had great conversations over dinner mm-hmm. with, you know, it's, there's, it's just something unique about these experiences. And that's yeah. why I'm, I'm so glad that we met. I am too. Like, you don't understand. And one of my favorite pictures of all time is a picture of you jumping into the water oh. in your underwear, <laughs> in his underwear. It's on my Instagram feed, folks. Man. Screenshot it, post it everywhere. Yeah. I mean, when, <laughs> when you're in Minneapolis and there's, there's a waterfall, you gotta, sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. That's right. Um, <laughs> Um, man, man, I think this is a perfect time to transition into every single episode. I love to ask a few questions to every single person, Okay, but I'm adding a bonus question because, dun, dun, dun. uh, I've learned so much from you about autism that I just want to ask, like, I just, I would love for you to share what are three things that everyone should know about people living with autism. Okay. Number one, and this is, this is so important. Um, we're not trying to be rude. Like people get so offended with people with autism, but like it's this is something that everyone is and with with Asperger specifically is dealing with. Like being blunt is so hard, like because you think that you're doing the right thing by saying what's on your mind. Like you know, you can come to me and say, "Oh, you know, how do I look?" I'm like, "Well, you look absolutely horrible." If you wanted an answer, <laughs> and. Like, people get offended, and they're just like, oh, well, thanks. Now my feelings are hurt. And so it's like, well, crap, now your feelings are hurt. Now my feelings are hurt because I hurt your feelings. So that is so important to, number one, not being rude at all. Number two is, and some people may disagree with this, but I feel like if you know anybody with autism or you have to encounter anyone with autism or you work with anybody with autism, you owe it to them to just take a moment and research Everything you can within that moment about autism. We're all in the same world, yes, but our minds are in different universes, I promise you that. And we have to put ourselves in yours every day because we have to be careful of what we do and what we say that we not offend you or make other people feel uncomfortable. Trust me, a lot of people, adults function with autism, do it. They're like, they have to remove themselves from situations so that way they can have their time or have their breakdown without people being like, oh, something's wrong with that person. And we make these these extra efforts to fit in. The least you can do is make the extra effort, learn about autism, learn how it affects us, learn what you can do to help us relax and communicate and take it back and do it. Mm. Like workplaces are so hard. You don't understand how hard it is to work in a place where you're the first person to work there with autism openly. Like It's so difficult because people don't understand how something – just as simple as walking up behind you without me seeing them and tapping me on the shoulder says, hey, Phil, how's your day? Can just change my entire day around because that unexpected contact from somebody is so uneasy, like it's so uncomfortable and it's crazy. Another thing, and this may sound simple, it's like these, these may sound a little goofy, but something else that's like really is big on me is understanding not trying to push things on people with autism don't try to change them don't try to the fact that so a lot of people with autism have strict diets of certain things they only eat certain things me i only eat literally grilled cheese pizza chicken tenders that's why i'm so fat i mean that's a pretty (laughs) that sounds pretty good though like i just started eating like baked chicken as an adult like for the last two years before Mm. that i was like no i don't want it um you have to really be careful to, because although you're thinking that it's like, oh, just try it. It's good. You'll like it. It's peer pressure and it's really stressful. Mm. Um, and when I speak to parents with children with autism, this is a question I get every time. Every town hall meeting I speak at or every event I speak at, they was like, what do we do about my child's diet? And I'm just like, don't force anything. Let them grow into it. Like I, I had to grow into it. And for me to be 24 at that time, just eating this food, let it happen when it happens. But uh, having somebody that, you know, understands that and will work with trying to um, I've had friends that work, try to like incorporate new foods. So 
there I got a friend and they were just like, okay, we're going to eat this. And I was like, what do you want? And I was like, well, you can eat that. I just want macaroni and cheese. They just gave me macaroni and cheese. Next time they're like, okay, how about we add a little corn? Hmm. And I'm like, uh, not a lot, just a little, a little corn. Okay. Let's add broccoli. Nope. Not having it. It's green. It looks nasty. <laughs> but eventually like I'm, was able to eat all these foods that I've never tried before. Mm. In 20 years of living, 20 plus years, I've never tried any of these foods, but now I'm eating all these things and I'm drinking these different these different drinks and like I love it all, but there's still a lot of things that I won't touch because I'm not comfortable with the texture or the appearance of the food. I'm like, I already know that's going to be nasty. And they're like, are you serious? And I hope a few of my friends don't listen to this, but all my friends believe that I'm allergic to seafood. It's not the case. Seafood is one of the foods that I will not touch. I used to eat it as a child. I used to eat fish and shrimp as a child. But as I grew older and my autism started to develop a little bit more and like more changes happened to me in the way I communicate it, that was one of the foods that got erased from my life. Mm. And I don't want anything to do with it. So a lot of people with autism, they have to say they're allergic to foods to stop people from trying to force them to try it. Like Fascinating. they have to say, I'm allergic. I have a f- I've talked to so many people with autism that say, what's your fake allergies? Because <laughs> they have to fake an allergy to get people to, to leave you alone sometimes. Hmm. So that's my three things. Those are three good things. So number one, don't be rude. You know, and I think a pretty good way to do that is probably just to imagine like if somebody is acting in a way where you're like, what, what's like, What's going on? You can be like, what if this is just Phil right now? Like, what yes. if I just bumped into Phil? He's not trying to be rude. Yes. Like, and and you don't need to be rude to him because, you know, it's just, you know. That's I, just, like, they, they're not doing this on purpose. It is not on purpose. Yeah. I promise you. And I love number two, which is essentially put yourself in someone else's shoes because you, Phil, do that every single day. You're saying, how are other people thinking? Okay, they're not thinking that way. Okay, that's good. That's good. The least we can do is have a little bit of understanding of, yeah. of what's going on in other people's heads. It's so weird. It's like I, f- and I, I, s- I did a, I recently wrote a, uh, a guest blog post for Autism Speaks about being an adult employee with autism. And I haven't even shared this on my social media because I don't want my coworkers to see it and feel some type of way. Mm. Like that's, that's what I'm doing. Like I don't want them to feel like, because some of, most of that article is written about things that happen at the current job. So I don't want them to see it and they feel bad because I'm so worried about their emotions that I have, I really haven't shared it on social media. That I wrote this blog post. You're such a nice guy. <laughs> it's horrible because I want them to see it so bad. Oh, man. <laughs> Cause I want them to see it like, okay, now that you know, you can stop doing that now. Yeah, man, dude, that's so good. That's super helpful. I hope that's helpful to lots of listeners. I'm I sure it will so. be. Man, question number two, how would you describe the kind of person that you most admire in the world? Um, it has to be my mother, and that's such a typical answer for people. But my mother was a full-time government employee who used drugs and raised an autistic son while homeless. Come on. Unreal. Like, I didn't know people could, could balance that many things. And she was an amazing individual, and people talk about... Her smile, I remember at my funeral, my best friends, they went up there, they just kept talking about her smile. And I'm just like, she like she had a smile and a laugh that was like amazing. Um, and she did so much. And although she did blow money on something as stupid as drugs, but it is an addiction, she also made sure that if I said, Mom, I want this Amtrak train car model for my set, she made sure the next day it was on my tracks rolling she worked so much with me like she was so patient with me and that's a i'm not gonna say it's a good and bad thing it was a great thing because that built like a connection between her and i that no one could ever get close to but at the same time it kind of hindered me from being able to develop a little bit because i kept on like okay mom's always going to be there and she eventually got clean and she cleaned up and she was clean for about seven years um before she passed away and she was still driving school buses and it was just it was uh, she was an amazing woman like I can't it, I, I wish she could just like come in real quick and just like like come down from heaven tell them real quick about how awesome you were and then you can go back I'll let you leave <laughs> but she was so I, she loved everybody and I I just I don't know like it's hard to explain that's like, beautiful 
my next question is what are you consuming right now that you love? So it's really not this. I know people come in and they talk about like, you know, oh, they're, they're doing this and they're studying this and reading this. And I am, wa- I am watching this damn Volvo commercial over and over again. <laughs> Tell me more. The Volvo commercial with the guy with the beard. I'm pulling this up. There's, uh, Tell me about if it. If you go to YouTube and type in Volvo commercial, there's one for like three minutes. So Volvo, kind of like the Matthew McConaughey Lincoln commercials, it came out and it had like this really nice like framing and like the photography was like really good and you know he's talking and there's good music playing. Volvo has this commercial that on TV they only show the end of the commercial and there's a guy riding in the car and the, you don't know what the hell's happening. Like you don't know what's going on, but offline or off of the TV they have a full three minute commercial where this guy is talking about giving his wife, his uh, daughter away to her husband and he's sitting there and he's sitting in the Volvo and he's writing it, the, the letter. And he, even though it's so like, I get stuck in like art like that, like the writing and the, the photography is so good and the acting is amazing. And I just can't stop watching it because that's where I want to be. I want to produce something like that. I want to be able to put some type of content out like that because I feel like that is that touched me like for that mm. like they they won like I hope someone from Volvo hears this like they did a great job because they pulled me into the fact that I watched this video once a day it's incredible well, Brandon you're going to watch this three minute video after this yeah I'm going to sit next to you and we're going to watch it we're not going to talk until it's over because if you talk once over I'm going to be upset <laughs> 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 but yeah um, VSEO this is not a plug whatsoever I promise has been a huge part of my creative process from Jump they were a huge part of, um, I did a journal post about my mother passing away. It was the first journal post that was posted to VSEO's journal platform. Mm. Um, they have shared it a few times at their company meetings um, to remind employees why they do what they do. Wow. They shared it in interviews with magazines and with news outlets. So VSEO's blog that has changed, um, I, I go back and I look at some of the older even though mm. I've read them so many times, I go back and I read some of the blog posts from a few years ago, like where they were interviewing like Chris Ozer on a regular basis. Like I read those and I'm just like, like this is like, they're talking about their love for photography and their love for exploring. And like, sometimes I need to remind myself of that because like, because VSEO was one of the companies that helped me build what I wanted to my feed and what I want my mood to be that's who I go back to to find my own like my own reasons I'm like okay I remember reading this years ago when I had 100 followers on Instagram and I remember saying okay that's how I feel I need to remember like this stuff so I spend a lot of time on VSEO's website their, that's great. their archived website not the new one I love that you're digging through but whether it's a commercial or whether it's blog posts for things of depth they make yeah. you feel things and inspire you to create more I think that's huge yeah and if anyone watches this Volvo commercial, <laughs> <laughs> like there is a scene, I'm going to share this. There is a scene at the end of the commercial where he says, I love you. And even though it's acting, it is so real to me. Like I feel it. It's so odd. It's so odd. The fact that I feel that. And it's family. Like he's writing this letter to his daughter. I can't wait until I can stand up in front of anybody and tell them how much I love them. And he's doing it in this commercial. And wow. it feels it feels so right to me. It's beautiful. Man, I've got one last question for you. Okie dokie. Based on the ways that you've chosen to step out and live your life differently, what's one thing you'd encourage someone else to do in their own life? Be your complete self. Don't, and this is such a weird word, don't sell out. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, don't let anyone change you. Determine what you want to do. Go out and do that one thing. So if you want to go out and you want to drive a bus, don't let people deter you by saying, oh, bus drivers only make this amount of hour. Go out, sh- grind to do what you want to do. Find your, 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 your own way of doing it and perfect it. Like, I didn't do that. I was so stupid. Like, I wanted to do what everybody else wanted me to do. Like, oh, go do this. And I did it. Like, oh, go 
be like I didn't really want to be an EMT for this company that I started off with. They were like, oh, go do this, and I did it, and I hated it. Like, if you listen to other people, you will make decisions that you'll regret because you're not listening to yourself, regardless of how bad. Take this from someone with autism who doesn't have that stop sign to stop them, so they just follow their own gut to their own intuition. It's not that bad. Like the regrets. I've quit jobs. I've I've gotten arrested for making dumb decisions without thinking about it. Like. It's not, it's going to make you a better person. You making these decisions, you falling down these stairs, you getting into these altercations, not physical, but like with yourself, you'll be able to, by the time you're, you're set in life, you won't have, you like, you'll know, like you'll, you'll have enough legwork in life with all your decisions that you'll just, I don't know, you'll, it'll make you a better person. So don't listen to anybody else. Like, listen to the positive, but don't let them change what you want to do. Because the one mistake a lot of us make is that we will allow someone else to enter our soul and make us rethink everything from love to decisions in our career. You'll have someone tell you, oh, that guy or that woman's not right for you. And you'll listen to them and you probably walked away from the best thing that could have ever happened to you. And you will never know because you allowed someone else to change your mind. Be your complete self. Mm-hmm. That is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And Phil, if people want to follow along with your incredible photos and uh, keep in touch online, what's the best way for them to do that? They can do it any type of way. So <laughs> I have a website that I built that I don't know anything about website building. So I don't even know if it looks right. But you know what? It works for me. Uh, it is DC Portraits. Dot org so it's dcportraits.org, or they can just find me on Instagram at phil.martin. Man, this has been so fun, Phil. Yes. Thank you so much for being on the show. No problem. I am so happy I drove here. I'm so happy I'm here. Like I don't want to be anywhere else in the world but sitting across this table from you. This has been so good. Yes, sir. Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey is part of the Gradient Podcast Network and is created in collaboration between me, Brandon Harvey, and Gradient. Check them out at gradient.is. That's gradient.is. Thank you so much to each of you who tuned into the podcast this week. If this is your first time listening, subscribe to the show to get a new inspiring story downloaded straight to your phone next week and every week. If you really connected with this episode, let's totally talk about it. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram with the username Brandon Harvey. That's Brandon with an E. And with that, that's a wrap for this week's podcast. I'll see you on the internet and I'll talk to you next week when we get the opportunity to learn from another inspiring person. Sound good?